I guess we can get started. Hopefully people will kind of trickle in as we go, but um, welcome everybody to panel three. And this is the um, Hebrew and Chinese panel. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jacqueline Cohen Steinberg and I'm a, a associate professor here at USC. Um, I'm very excited about this panel and all the speakers today. Um, just a little bit about how it's gonna work. We're gonna um, have, there's three different talks so each um, talk will go for about 15 minutes and I'll give everyone like a five minute warning in the chat um, and then probably a two minute warning in the chat as well. Um, and then after um, the each session, then um, or after each talk, we'll um, have plenty of time for questions, I think. Um, so if you have questions, hold them till the end. If you wanna put them in the chat, feel free. Um, we can kind of make a list as well. Um, and um, yeah, otherwise, welcome everyone. Um, our first talk, our first speaker actually is from Michal Schomer, and um, she's going to talk to us about multi-gender Hebrew, creating a new space in the Hebrew language. Thank you so much, Michal. Uh, uh, Michal, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, let me share my screen. So I hope you can all see my screen and hear me well. Um, yes. My name is, great. Uh, my name is Michal Shomer. Um, I'm uh, the creator and designer of Multigender Hebrew, which I will talk about today. Um, I'm, I'm a designer, a visual communication design, designer, a graphic designer, and uh, specifically this project, uh, Multigender Hebrew, involves the field of typography, which is the art and technique of designing and arranging text. So everything related to text, designing letters, etc. And I'm going to start with an overview of how gender comes into play in the Hebrew language. And then I will, I will move on to my own development, multigender Hebrew, uh, which is being used in Israel and also a bit around the world. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so, so some background on Hebrew. Hebrew is, um, is a very, very gendered language. So Almost all words in Hebrew have a grammatical gender, either feminine or masculine. There are two grammatical genders, binary options, two binary options. Um, and this applies for, for all parts of the language, verbs, nouns, adjectives, pronouns, numbers. So really almost all words in Hebrew have a grammatical gender. And I, I wanted to share here um, a quote from a poem by the Israeli Hebrew poet Yona Volach. And she writes that Hebrew is a sex maniac, or in Hebrew, Ivrit he sex maniakit. And I really, really relate to that uh, quote um, because I feel like Hebrew always forces us to, to choose sides or take a decision when it comes to gender or to, to sex and gender and to always think about this issue and deal with this issue. And let me share some examples. So these are some random Hebrew words from different uh, grammatical structures. And on the top row, you can see the word everyone. Um, in Hebrew, the masculine form is kulam and the feminine form is kulan, so the difference is in the final uh, letter or the, the sound, the sound of the final letter, M versus N. And this is the case for a lot of Hebrew words where the difference is highlighted in red, as you can see, the differences are in the final, um, the, the ending of the words or in, in the beginning of the words. Also, I wanted to highlight another word, uh, friends. So you can see that, um, the, the three first letters are the root of the word, um, are the same in the masculine and the feminine form, but the ending is different. Chavarim for the masculine and chavarot for the feminine. Uh, so this is the case for a lot of Hebrew words. And in the same poem of Yona Volach titled Hebrew, she also says that in plural, men have the right of way. So, um, as, as you all know from other gendered languages, um, the, the generic form is, is the masculine form or officially the masculine form is considered to be the generic form. And this is a challenge for Hebrew speakers and for other languages as well. What we mostly hear is this masculine form, even when we wanna talk about a group that includes people of all genders or um, if someone is talking about an individual with an unknown gender. So we always hear this masculine gener 
generic form. And um, I wanted to briefly mention a few highlights and studies from, from Israel or around Hebrew um, that, that talk about how language impacts our minds and our perception. So first of all, um, in Israel, there is uh, the Employment Equal Opportunities Law uh, that, as you can see, for, from 1988, so not, not from recent years. And by law, any ad calling for uh, new employees has to be written using both the feminine and masculine forms. I, I cannot say that this is enforced, but this is the law. And I think that it's interesting because it shows that there is um, this official um, recognition or acknowledgement by the, the, the state, the country, that if we want to have equal opportunities um, around employment, then, then the language is a tool to get there or might be a tool to get there. Now, another interesting study that was done in Israel uh, some time ago um, gave women and men answer um, uh, some questionnaires about their uh, motivation or how they perceive themselves in, in the context, context of, of completing tasks and so on. And they found that women reported lower task value when the questionnaire was written in the masculine generic form compared with a gender neutral form. And also women reported lower self-efficacy than men when the questionnaire was written in the masculine generic form. Again, we see some impact um, of the language on our perception. And lastly for today, a study, a really interesting study that was done very recently, published recently, um, this study found that addressing women examinees in the masculine form has a ne negative impact on their achievements. So this is a, a graph from, from the publication where you can see um, the grades that the men received and the grades that the women received. Uh, note that the, this graph starts from five and obviously the grades start from zero. Um, and on the red column, um, you can see the grades that they received when the exams were, were written in the singular masculine form, such as Ktov, Ane, Namek, if you know some Hebrew. And in the green column, you can see the grades that they received when the exams were written in the uh, plural imperative neutral form, such as Kitvu, Anu, Namku, Hasbiru. So you can see that there is a gap here um, of the grades in the grades that the women received when answering these um, exams. And this is very interesting and also, I think, very important study because um, after it was published, a few universities and schools have instructed their teams to, to uh, write tasks and exams using this gender um, neutral plural form. And this has an hopefully an immediate, immediate positive impact on girls and women. Um, so there, there are a lot of uh, challenges in the Hebrew language, but there are some solutions that Hebrew speakers use to, to make the language more inclusive. Some of them may be to use um, uh, forms of the language that are gender neutral, like infinitive or plural imperative or past, future, or combining endings of feminine and masculine forms, or using the dash or dot or uh, slash as, as also being used in other languages. A lot of it is just uh, putting more efforts when you write or speak and being aware of that to be able to, to use the language in a more inclusive way. So you can see some ads uh, where I highlighted these all of these techniques people use to make the, the text more inclusive. And also for non-binary folks in Hebrew speaking um, communities or in Israel, um, so there's no really a day um, option in Hebrew, not a singular day as there is in English. So people are using mostly a mixed language, which, mean, which means they will use both feminine and masculine forms to refer to themselves. So I can say, I'm very tired, and the word tired would be in the masculine form. I want to sleep, and the word want to be in the feminine form. And this is how a lot of non-binaries in Israel would use um, the language to, to make, to, to feel more at home uh, with Hebrew. 
And now I'm super, super excited and happy to present to you here um, Multigender Hebrew, which is another solution or proposal that I created um, to, to address this challenge in the Hebrew language. So first of all, Multigender Hebrew has two main goals. Um, one is to acknowledge women's presence in the language and include women. And another goal is to form an all-inclusive all linguistic space for non-binary people and non-conforming uh, folks. And what is multigender Hebrew? So multigender Hebrew is a new set of Hebrew letters that I designed that are added to the Hebrew alphabet and um, facilitate multigender and inclusive reading and writing. So you can see some example here. Um, the, the phrase here says, all people are equal. Now, if this would have been written with standard um, Hebrew letters without the multigender letters, this would say either all men are equal using the masculine generic or all women are equal. And now with the multigender Hebrew letters, it says all people are equal. And now, I, I designed these new letters as a solution for the written language only. So the, there's no new, new way to pronounce these new letters. And here you can see the entire Hebrew alphabet, including the new letters I designed with two different fonts. So it's important to understand that I did not design a new font, one gender inclusive font, but I designed new letters that can technically be added to any Hebrew font, used with any Hebrew font. And let's take a, take a closer look into these letters. So here you can see the phrase welcome, uh, in Hebrew it's two words, and highlighted in red are the visual differences between the masculine and the feminine forms. And this is how it looks like with multi-gender Hebrew. So the design is sort of a combination between the masculine ending and the feminine ending. Uh, these two new letters are called Yuv and Final Tem. I also uh, uh, gave the new letters names, new names. Um, and here's another example of the phrase I love him or I love her. In Hebrew, there would be four uh, binary options in traditional Hebrew. And this is how it looks like with multigender Hebrew. So you can see the word, the, the new letters ta, va, and also the nikud sign that I designed in addition to this, these letters rev. Um, and this sign, the, the purpose of this sign is to, to emphasize the fact that this letter or this word has a multi-gender meaning. Um, it's, it's up to the writer to decide if they want to include this sign or not, like any other Nikud signs in Hebrew. And let's take a look at another example, the word everyone, which I mentioned before, um, that you can see the visual difference is in the final letter, Ulam, Kulan, M or N. And this is how it looks like with multi-gender Hebrew, uh, with the new letter, final name, which is uh, one of my personal favorites. Um, I designed a total of 12 new characters, 11 new letter and letters, and one Nikud sign. And the process to de design these new letters was pretty uh, traditional. So um, these are scans from the original drawings that I made. Um, I printed out a lot of uh, words and letters and worked with a transparent paper and just drew them and copied them step by step. Was uh, was a long process of trial and error until I got to, to the result that I was happy with. So you can see some of these examples are not le legible, not readable at all, but some of them are more, are, are closer to the final um, design. And the reason why I, I did this project, I mean, I'm sure everyone here in this context understands um, some of, uh, of I don't know, how, how important this is, but I personally uh, really, really believe in, in activism and, and in working towards change. And I think that if something around us is not working right or needs um, to be better, then we have the responsibility as, as individuals, as, as, as institutions, um, everyone within their own limits and cap capabilities um, to do better, to do, uh, to improve things. So I tried to use the design tools that I have, the typographic skills to address this, this challenge in the Hebrew language. And 
this project started as my graduation project in my bachelor's degree. I graduated about five years ago. And um, after, after I graduated, I continued to develop the new uh, design and I published free files for download with this phrase, welcome in multi-gender Hebrew. And so many people and institu institutions just downloaded these files and started to use these graphics in, in the public space. So there are some photos here from the north of the country, from the south, um, from the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. Um, a lot of schools and university put up these signs at the entrance. Um, on the bottom row, second to the right, this is a photo from my elementary school, which was super uh, exciting to see. And then I continued to, to work on the design and on the technical implementation. And uh, about three years ago, I uh, released a free version for download that includes all new letters um, and a, in a font and a keyboard that allows people to type them and use them on their computers. And since this version was out, I, I keep getting more and more examples of people, people using the new uh, type. So you can see here some, some personal notes that people wrote. You can see um, on the bottom right side a poem written in multi-gender Hebrew. Um, it was uh, handed out to support the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, there's a wedding invitation um, with multi-gender Hebrew, a straight wedding invitation, uh, some ads calling for employees using the new letters. We talked about it a bit. There, there are even some tattoos with multi-gender Hebrew. And um, there were even uh, there are even some books that were published uh, using the new letters. So there's a children book and a book about education. And about two years ago, we had a writing contest organized by Tali Bleicher, which is not related to me, didn't know me before. And um, she initi initi um, initiated this, this um, contest where people had uh, were invited to submit poems and short stories using the new letters. And more than 130 works were submitted. And this is the winning poem. Um, you have to wrap up as soon as you. Yeah, yeah, um, just what, <laughs> 60 seconds and I'm done. Okay, so thanks. Um, so this is the, um, uh, there was recently an, an article in the New York Times about everything that, that's happening in, in Israel around Hebrew and gender. And I was also really lucky to be interviewed there. And uh, they mentioned multi-gender Hebrew. And my work is also presented now in uh, Design Museum Hulon, which is really an amazing uh, recognition. And there are, of course, many other initiatives around um, gender and language related to Hebrew. Some are based in Israel, some are outside of Israel. And just to wrap up, I wanted to give you some examples of longer texts with multi-gender Hebrew and some numbers. So you can see that this text has 14% um, of the words use, using multi-gender Hebrew. And this text that is talking about Corey, a person who uses they, they, they them pronouns and raises their child with, with they, them pronouns, uh, has more verbs and adjectives that are using multi-gender Hebrew. So in this case, there is 36% of words are using the new letters. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here and I will be happy to get your questions at the end. So thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, actually, there was a message in the chat if you could go back to the QR code real quick. I don't know if you- um, Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Just Not sure which one, though, that. but- <laughs> one I'll, I'll add in the chat the link to the website and facebook and instagram so you can check it out perfect okay. thank you so much that was wonderful thank you so much um so great so our next speaker is um jun lang uh from 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 pomona college um and she's going to be speaking to us uh, her her talk today is entitled chinese language and gender exploring gender inclusive language pedagogy welcome Hi, um, thank you. So um, hello, everyone. I'm also very excited to be here. And I was really inspired by the first presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Jun Lang, um, uh, or Lang Jun, Assistant Professor of Chinese at Pomona College. I'm very grateful for having this opportunity to share 
my recent gender inclusive pedagogy with you at this conference. I actually presented some part of this work with my students at, at a different venue, which was an international Chinese linguistic conference. And I modified this presentation, hoping to bring this to a wider intellectual co community who focused on language teaching and gender inclusivity. So thank you so much USC for hosting this wonderful event. Um, so um, in this presentation, I'll talk about how I incorporated gender into a Chinese language and a linguistic course. And for the language course, I focus on students' learning interest and the creative final project assignments. And then I'll also showcase some students' creative work. And for the linguistic course, um, I will share students' learning reflections and then showcase some of their research projects. And lastly, I'll talk about my teaching reflections and the broader implications. And a very brief introduction as gender studies garnered um, prominent attention, there has been an increasing enthusiasm among American college students to explore gender and feminism, especially among our uh, Gen Z students. Uh, recent years have witnessed a rising trend in interdisciplinary courses within American Chinese programs. And um, these courses have um, two general trends. Uh, they either use literature or films as learning materials for undergraduate studies or focus on linguistics geared only toward uh, ling uh, linguistic graduate students. And there appears to be less attention to offer college level Chinese language or linguistic courses with a focus on gender. Um, so how do we address the increasing learning interest in gender and incorporate it in a language course? I will show how I integrated gender related content and gender inclusive um, pedagogy into these two types of courses at a liberal arts college. So first I incorporated gender into a Chinese language course titled uh, introduction to Pop Culture in China, which is a topic-based course offered last spring. And I did not rely on any existing textbooks, but created all of the materials based on stu students' learning interests. And before I offered this course, I did a survey asking students if they're interested in taking this new course about society, culture, and gender, and what topics interested them. And here are my survey results. Um, so you can see that there are some gender related topics such as um, the changing culture of love and marriage and the Chinese Me Too movement and gender awareness in the digital space. So these topics gained a lot of attention from students. And based on this result, I designed this course for students of intermediate um, proficiency level because for a lot of students who are not considering majoring or minoring in Chinese, they are unlikely to take advanced courses so that they wouldn't be able to explore the language and the culture in depth. But if this course is offered at an intermediate level, it allows more students of lower proficiency levels to consider taking it. And um, the learning goals also align with the three major skills defined by ACTFL including interpretive, uh, interpersonal, presentational skills. I also added this in their cultural skill because I think being able to make um, comparisons and explain some diversity um, between cultures is also very important. And the highlight of this course is the um, final project. Um, so students got to choose what they wanted to create for this final project. And also because we have this design and the craft center, um, offering students space to develop their um, creative potential. I asked students to utilize these resources to probe some real world questions related to our course topics, which can be transformed into a sustained inquiry involving hands-on learning to create something uh, like a public product to um, demonstrate it or showcase this product to public audience. Um, so here's our final products, uh, final projects assignments. Uh, which contain, uh, contains two components. Um, the first one is the public product. So they can create or craft something um, that can represent one or more topics covered by this course, either individually or collaboratively. They're also encouraged to use this um, creative space to create something like a t-shirt, a tote bag, jewelry, paintings, videos, photos, music, arts, whatever they want to, to do. And um, the second component is a presentation. So they will showcase this product to a public audience, uh, describing 
what they did, explain how they did it and why they chose this topic and the significance of their product and how this reflects their um, the topics and the, and their understanding of the topics and also helped students to build on um, this um, project on five stages. The first stage um, is the topic selection. So students need to think about and come up with their uh, driving questions. And the second stage involves a short report. So if they encounter any challenges, they should develop a plan to address these issues. Therefore, um, fostering sustained um, inquiry through hands-on learning. And stage three and stage four require them to write and revise their final presentation drafts. And the last present, uh, last stage is the final presentation. So they need, they need to showcase their final public product to a public audience. And now I would like to showcase some of uh, my students' creative final projects related to gender topics. So the first one was made, uh, were created by my student Jenny Wei. And um, she um, actually, after learning about um, the Chinese Me Too movement, um, uh, Jenny created this poem from a um, survivor's perspective, accusing the celebrity uh, named Chris Wu of multiple sexual assaults on minor girls. And this poem is called 18 Years Old, Shiba uh, Sui. And here is the uh, English translation, you can take a look. And this poem is actually very well written in Chinese, probably both English and Chinese. Um, leaving a very uh, impressive, um, positive, and uh, long-lasting effect on her audience. And um, in her presentation, she also explained why she chose this topic and why she decided to write a poem. It was mainly because she hoped to help these um, survivors to reclaim their rights as women. And the next one um, is called The Me Too Window. Um, created by Jesse Zhang. And in the middle of this window are two Chinese characters um, pronounced as mi and tu, which literally mean bunny rice. And because the English hashtag me too has been uh, censored in Chinese media, so creative Chinese feminists found an alternative way to try to keep this campaign alive using rice bunny to replace the English me too. And um, uh, in um, Jesse's um, presentation, Jessie is an art major. She explained how she made this window and she also used a powerful LED light to reflect on the window, making it really bright and hopeful. So because of this materials and the physics effect, the color of this window changed from opaque white to a sky blue symbolizing brightness and hope. And this is also the meaning of this project, uh, which is to encourage people to support one another and uh, to bring about societal change altogether. And the next uh, example is Auditi uh, Cole's work, uh, who created this Chinese style, a tube skirt popularized in the 1920s during the Republic of China. So re she researched this topic um, on her own and found out that actually women's um, participation in political movements and sports activity is closely related to what they wear. Um, so as opposed to wearing long, traditional tight dresses constraining women's physical movements, Aditi found out that the Chinese New Culture Movement in the 1920s brought about progressive values and changes in women's clothing styles to increase gender equality. And also because she was interested in the globalization covered in by our class, she added some uh, Western elements, a piece of um, lace fabric into her handmade skirt. And the linguistic course uh, titled Chinese Language and Gender is a common course taught in English. I offered um, half a year ago. And here I'm showing you um, the weekly schedules we included in the syllabus. We covered many research papers and topics such as the linguistic sexism and uh, gender labeling, uh, such as politics of um, labeling among LGBTQ Hong Kongers. And we also learned um, a lot of things about gender um, pronouns and gender in media. We also have some research methods, learning sessions to learn about re uh, uh, linguistic research tools. For example, students use the Google Ngram to analyze language and gender and society and history. They also learned um, sociolinguistic and corpus linguistic uh, analysis. And we also have um, some other topics, including gender in media, uh, gender identity and the linguistic variation and also um, the Chinese women's script, which is a, a secret female only language. Um, 
And uh, now let me show you some of my students' learning reflections. So for Emma Tom, she first appreciated that our class was research-centered, requiring students to complete three mini research projects involving different research methods, allowing them to build up their uh, research skills to conduct a larger research project. And also she thinks I was very uh, receptive and open to suggestions to better facilitate their learning experiences. And thirdly, our class size was very small. So all of the students were comfortable sharing their thoughts even now sensitive topics related to LGBTQ and race. And Emma also liked that what we said in class remained in this classroom and how inclusive our class was. And lastly, we also had peer assessment and collaborative grading and instructor's feedback, including positive and constructive ones. And for Sydney Tai, she appreciated that our class was student-centered and each student got to choose an article they're interested in to lead a discussion um, involving creativity and interactivity. So for example, Sydney chose an article um, about how Chinese men constructed their ideal manhood on the Chinese, in the Chinese dating show. To allow her peers to have a similar experience, she asked her peers to turn on their phone buzzers to judge a suitor and to turn it off if they didn't think this man was a potential date. Um, so this is a very fun way to digest information, especially for students who are not very familiar with this kind of dating shows. And Cindy also liked that uh, her peers, Maya and Anna, created this very fun interactive board game to encourage everyone to participate in the discussion sessions. And regarding students' final projects, I guess I only have the time to showcase two of them. So um, Emma chose to study the commodification of Chinese beauty standards using corpus and the sociolinguistic analysis we covered in class. She found that although many Chinese women considered the desirable beauty standard, bio show, which is pale, pale, young, skinny, and healthy, they're not always conscious of how deeply entrenched uh, the standard is in society and underlying reasons um, that contribute to its widespread acceptance. And Sydney cares about teenagers' mental health and well-being, so she studied gender differences in emotional expressions. So she did a social linguistic survey to see if men and women are both allowed to express their emotions freely she invited her participants to fill in this, the blanks of these statements or um, sentences using different gender pronouns, the masculine, feminine, inanimate, and the uh, recent gender neutral pronoun using romanization um, to present um, this um, non-binary gender pronoun. So she found that while uh, women were expected to cry more, men were expected to express happier emotions and there was also a new trend using gender neutral uh, expressions. So um, to adding students' um, reflections, I think uh, incorporating, incorporating gender into these two courses maximized the students' creative freedom, which allowed them to engage in individualized creative learning process to increase their linguistic competence in the language course and to improve their research skills um, in the linguistic course. And of course, all of them improve their understanding of current gender issues in the Chinese speaking world. And also regarding the broader implications, um, the overall enrollment of US Chinese uh, programs actually has been decreasing. So I believe incorporating gender as a topic into these two types of courses can change the situation a little bit because it aligns with our new generation's um, learning interests, not only because these uh, gender related topics are cultural or local, but also because they are political and global and that our students care about these critical issues. And exactly because of this, students are strongly motivated to participate in learning, to create their um, very interesting creative projects and research projects and their learning outcomes are maximized. And this diversifies our um, current cur curriculum by sparking discussions on the intersectionality of gender, class, and race, giving our diverse student body the opportunity to contribute their multicultural perspectives. And um, I also want to thank my students whose creative ideas inspired this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 
So we have one presentation left. Um, we have uh, Yen Fei Li and Hang Wang who are gonna present um, their talk is entitled Designing Gender Inclusive Learning Materials for Chinese as a Foreign Language Classroom. Thank you so much, welcome. Thank you. Uh, can I share my screen now? Let me see. Hopefully you were made a co-host. Yes, we see it. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> perfect. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yan Fei, Yan Fei Li. I teach Chinese uh, in the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, I'm glad that I have the opportunity today to share with you one of my pedagogical projects. Uh, also presenting with me is my wonderful, wonderful graduate research assistant, uh, Wang Heng. Uh, Heng, uh, would you like to uh, say hello uh, very quickly to our participants? Where's sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Heng Wang. I'm an MA student and a graduate research assistant and teaching assistant at the Chinese language program at the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee. And it seems that I'm not the co-host, so maybe uh, you will share my screen for me. Is that okay? Later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the slides. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the project that we're presenting today actually is an ongoing one. So it is essentially about the uh, binary gender content in our uh, Mandarin Chinese classrooms and wh what we want to do about them. So hearing the keynote speech and uh, all those uh, fantastic uh, uh, presentations earlier today, I have got so many inspirations and realized that uh, uh, so many scholars and educators actually are working on multiple pathways towards a more uh, gender diverse and more gender inclusive uh, uh, classroom. And our project uh, maybe is our Mandarin Chinese uh, uh, response to that kind of uh, call for transformation. Uh, so in the presentation, I'm going to introduce the uh, backgrounds, aims, and methods of the project. And uh, Dan Heng is going to share uh, the two cases, actually two learning modules that she helped to uh, build. So if we still have a little bit of time at the very end, probably we could uh, just uh, briefly um, talk about our reflections on uh, how we feel about working on this uh, ongoing project. Uh, the inquiries of the project uh, actually uh, originates uh, from two common disconnections observed in our classrooms. Uh, one is between our learning materials and uh, where our society's understanding of gender is actually at today. Our learning materials hardly address the, or reflect the linguistic and cultural changes uh, stemming from three decades of uh, gender studies and queer activism in the Sinophone world, disconnecting from the ongoing dialogue of gender justice and the inclusivity uh, in the classroom. So I put a handful of major events in the development of gender studies and queer activism in the Sinophone world in the purple text on the right. The list is far from uh, representative and uh, exhaustive, but I intentionally selected some early moments and uh, uh, a more recent one to show how far the field uh, has advanced and how dynamic uh, the communities have grown uh, uh, nowadays. So anything in between that uh, uh, has not been uh, listed here may have exactly been the content that we already missed in our uh, uh, language classrooms. Uh, Another disconnection that is uh, one of the basis for our project is uh, the disconnection uh, between our textbooks and the learner's demands. Uh, popular textbooks like uh, Integrated Chinese, Chinese Odyssey, uh, and New Practical Chinese Readers fail to cont contextualize the dominance of binary lexicon and gender narratives that they represent, disconnecting from the learner's uh, growing needs for non-binary and gender inclusive alternatives. So I put two uh, real classroom examples on the right here. So the top one actually is from a first year Mandarin student. Uh, they have a transgender uh, relative from uh, their mom's side and they were very curious about uh, whether they could address them properly in the Mandarin Chinese. And our popular textbooks don't uh, provide answers to questions like that from our learners, uh, but uh, those questions are nonetheless very important uh, that needs to be addressed to transform our classroom. 
So to bring the um, changing views of uh, gender expressions and gender identities in the social reality uh, into our classrooms to meet our learners' needs and curiosities about those kind of uh, uh, terms and vocabulary and even how to address those kind of uh, social situations uh, properly, uh, we propose to uh, do this kind of uh, uh, project. So our pro project uh, uh, primarily aims to uh, develop learning and teaching materials adaptable to uh, CFL curricula in North American universities. While developing those materials, we keep the uh, open resource design concept in mind. So our materials will eventually uh, uh, be acceptable and uh, digitally available to both instructors and learners, hopefully uh, all over the world. And uh, we are also plan to collaborate with uh, uh, educators and learners and especially to spirit LGBTQ plus community members to ensure that our materials will remain up to date with the social linguistic reality and reflective of learners study needs. So what we actually do uh, in developing those materials as something I called mapping, locating and redeveloping. So mapping is to sur survey our own curriculum among many other major North American universities and outline a common curriculum based on proficiency standards such as uh, the common uh, uh, European framework, uh, Act 4, uh, HSK, and T TCFL, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, based on the proficiency standards, cultural competency objectives, and uh, intercultural competency levels. Locating is to find uh, in the common curriculum which area to act upon. For instance, the binary gender lexicon, topics, cultural context, and, commun communic uh, and communication scenarios. And redeveloping means to contextualize and historicize the binary gender content and redesign gender inclusive materials and activities to transform uh, those uh, uh, so-called more traditional and previous versions of the practice in the classroom. So. Uh, we've done uh, those kind of mapping, locating uh, already for our four years of uh, uh, language study programs. Uh, so here's an example for the first year uh, 100 level uh, Chinese Mandarin classes. Uh, here, the mapping part, we figure out uh, what kind of uh, grammar, vocabulary, syntax, and uh, uh, cultural understanding and inter intercultural competence that we need to uh, guide the student to uh, to learn about and to train the student to be able to uh, uh, acquire those kind of skills. And for the locating part, we locate those kind of common topics that is suitable for the language level, for language proficiency on this level, for example, introducing family members, uh, occupations, and dating, those areas that more or less we will encounter those kind of binary non-binary uh, kind of uh, uh, addresses and terms and scenarios. And uh, later on, he is going to uh, present uh, one example uh, case, uh, one example of learning module uh, for this level of students. Uh, that is the family tree uh, exercise or practice. So I think I will leave the time to uh, Hung. Uh, I need to quickly change my, yeah. my slides here. Sorry. Where is that? Where does that go? Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee. So in the next part, we will draw two cases as our anticipated practices for designing gender inclusive materials for CFL classrooms. So the first case is family tree. So the family tree learning material is designed for students on the novice level, which is usually the first year Mandarin Chinese course. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, the first year Mandarin learning goal is to develop learners' basic survival skills of communicating in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, to achieve this goal, our classes cover uh, firstly the Chinese phon uh, phonetic uh, system, which is pinyin, and 500 basic words, and also simple sentence structures such as a predictive adjective sentences, action verb sentences, places for location words, and time phrases in sentences. Uh, the practical communication scenarios are uh, including greetings, introducing family and friends, discussing work and school, etc. Though Mandarin is grammarly genderless, uh, gender lexicon and implied gender uh, social discourses appear in the learning materials uh, in the first level course, uh, including topics ranging from self-introduction, family members and dating. 
Uh, these arrangements often fall short in describing learners and their family diverse identities and sexualities, uh, as uh, Professor just uh, Professor Lee just showed uh, some of our uh, students um, bring up, uh, especially in the emergence of queer kinship and diverse parenting. Uh, therefore, we want to create opportunities to unpack gender norms embedded in the language. Uh, moreover, we would like to offer gender inclusive alternatives and invite students to think together and share their choices of the use of the language. And specifically for the family tree case, our learning objectives are introducing the uh, binary gender mandatory terms of core family members as well as the gender neutral equivalents. Uh, we, will, we want to familiarize the students with the context of both of the terms and enable the students to use sets of terms grammatically and culturally appropriately. Um, as you can see, we list the binary gender Chinese with the respective English translation on the left and a family tree template on the right. Uh, we will teach the binary gender Chinese terms of core family members and ask students to draw the family tree according to the uh, template. Uh, then we will show students some visual cues uh, so next slide, uh, as you can see on the left, and to introduce the diverse forms of kinship other than the cisgender heterosexual biparental family, uh, including single parent, two moms, two dads, uh, biparental family with one or two non-binary parents, uh, similar as grandparents and grandchildren, and married and unmarried couples with, with one or two non-binary individuals. Uh, then we will teach the inclusive gender neutral Chinese about core family members, uh, as you can see on the right. Uh, we use parenting Chinese to replace father and mother, uh, child in place of son, daughter, etc. Uh, now we will ask students to redraw their family tree without a template using these gender inclusive terms uh, they just learned. And uh, this is a little bit uh, recap of the teaching plan. Uh, after sharing their new family tree in the class, the final step, we ask your students to write a short passage introducing a family member other than the cisgender heterosexual biparental family as the assignment. So finishing the teaching circle, uh, we provide students with a can-do list. So uh, as you can see, uh, we have three uh, can-do list. They can use gendered uh, to greet uh, both gendered and uh, gender neutral turns to greet and introduce their family members and they can uh, switch between these two depending on context. And our case two is uh, designed for our 300, uh, the third year level of Chinese language course. We title it, title it as from women can hold half of the sky to queer rights advocacy. Uh, for our third year Mandarin course, the primary learning goal is to develop students' language proficiency through culture topics such as uh, poetry, proverbs, myths for folklore, uh, social customs, religious practices, geographic attractions, and many more. Uh, during the learning process, students are expected to grow their vocabulary to 600 words. Um, uh, they should be able to structure longer sentences and paragraphs with the help of uh, presuppositions, uh, conjunctions, and the uses of different tenses and clauses. Uh, closely connected to the topic today, students are trained to understand the Chinese context of contemporary issues. Um, these topics and others offer right spots in our curriculum to explore queer and feminist pedagogical possibilities. Uh, we intend to uh, create a learning module that gives students a glimpse of the history from a uh, woman can hold half of the sky proposed by uh, Mao uh, to the queer rights advocacy in the latest years. Uh, the learning objectives uh, of this module include acquiring vocabularies in different gender identities, understanding histories about women, uh, rights, and queer rights presented in short readings, uh, being able to conduct a brief research on topics related to short readings, obtain basic discussing gender and sexuality in both spoken and written forms, and knowing how to raise difficult questions about gender uh, respectfully and mind Mindfully. And uh, specifically, firstly, we will, uh, we will prepare six short essays, normally from uh, 500 to 600 words, which give an overview of some of the most important aspects in relation to gender issues in China. Uh, they are titled as Women Can Hold Half of the Sky, Context, Implication, and Influence, uh, China's Family Planning, and its Aftermath. 
urbanization and the changing occupation structure of Chinese women, a short history of criminalizing sex workers in China, anti-sexual harassment and Me Too movement in China, case of Xianzi, and queer and trans rights in contemporary China. Uh, for instance, the text outlines the uh, queer movement from the 90s to present, introducing the notion of coming out, the emergence of queer communities, same-sex marriage rights, and employment discrimination faced by trans people. And uh, uh, next slide, please. The essay includes vocabulary such as sexual minority, homosexual, bisexual, transgender, same-sex marriage, assigned sex, gender identity, and sexual, sexual orientation, etc. Uh, we asked students to form a group of two to select one topic and to do a six to eight minutes presentation. Requires uh, include summarize the assigned essay and locate new vocabularies and unfamiliar grammars in the essay for the class. Then we will teach these vocabularies and grammars and some cultural backgrounds. Uh, finally, we asked students to create a short uh, situational dialogue with their partner and write it down as an, as an assignment. Yes, I can finish it in one minute. And take our design essay as an example. Uh, we will provide students with prompts for them to make up a dialogue. Uh, so for example, suppose a person A uh, is experiencing employment discrimination due to their gender expression and complaining to their uh, friend, person B, and person B tries to comfort uh, person A uh, with what we just learned in this essay. Uh, so similarly, we will provide the students with a can-do list after the learning circle and help them self-examine if they have met the module's requirements. Uh, for example, I can use the terms in relation to gender and sexuality in everyday conversation. I can summarize an event case and a figure in relation to China's gender issues. I can initiate a dialogue in relation to specific gender issues in China according to the context. And I can write a short essay in relation to gender issues. So uh, I don't think we have time for more reflections, uh, but we welcome any uh, comments, critics, and uh, suggestions in the Q&A. Thank you so much. This is our reference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. These were all wonderful, um, wonderful presentations.